Hello. Today I'm going to be talking about the Janowski QGD, or the Queen's Gambit declined with an early A6. Uh, I've written a blog for a while, and I've done some write-ups on openings, so some of it I'm going to be reading from that. I don't know how that'll work on video, but I wanted to try it out. Um, but the core opening we're going to be looking at is d4, d5, very solid, stopping white getting their stake in the center, c4. Now white threatens cd5, and if queen d5, knight c3 will hit the queen and then e4. So black's main moves are to reinforce the center. We're going to reinforce the center with e6, the solidest move. This does block the bishop coming out, but often if the bishop comes out early, this pawn will be weak anyway. And we usually can find something to do with the bishop. e6, knight c3. Now I'm going to talk a little later about 3a6, but for now we're going to play knight f6. It should be noted that very popular these days and recommended in just about every repertoire book you'll ever see is the exchange variation against knight f6 with the point that the bishop comes to g5 and is annoying. So lots of people that want to play the QGD play bishop e7 here. Now of course takes followed by bishop g5 is not a thing, so if white wants to exchange they have to settle for the less pressuring bishop f4. Um, now, bishop e7 does preclude black from bringing the bishop to a more active square on b4. These are different lines. So first, we're going to talk about knight f6. Again, this does allow this cd5, bishop g5 exchange that many players are afraid of, which is why later in the video, I'm going to talk about 3a6 instead, try to get into our core idea a move faster, and thus not allow bishop g5s. All right, so the line we're going to be looking at is going to be against knight f3. Now, if we look at this position and we look in the database at the master level, you can see CD5 is getting chosen here a huge amount of the time. Bishop G5, quite a lot. We can still play our idea against Bishop G5 and Knight F3, not so much. Um, still a lot though. In the Lee Chess Online database, you'll see the exchange not as popular and Knight F3 is the most popular move. It is a main move, but again, if we're playing this move order where we play 4A6, Gotta have something against the exchange. Gotta have something against bishop g5. Alright. Knight f3. I'm gonna get rid of the database. a6. Now, uh, I will also link, I got some of the theory I'm gonna be showing from a public study by Tony Rotella, who I think is a really interesting theoretician. He wrote a book called The Killer Sicilian about the Kalashnikov that is very highly regarded, though I've not gotten my hands on it, and I've read some of his posts in various places. He's, I believe, like 2100, 2200 strength, but clearly has really nice understandings of the opening and put together a work that really holds up despite being written by a lower standard of player than most books are written. I think if you put in the work, if you're capable of explaining and understanding moves, you can do that. And he's done a phenomenal job, and we're going to be learning somewhat from him. I will link to the study in the notes to this YouTube video, and you can check that out. So what does a6 do? Well, occasionally we want to control the b5 square for like knight b5 or bishop b5, but that's not really the point. Uh, I should also advertise this opening by saying Carlson has played it. Uh, if we look at this position, you'll see Carlson played it to a draw against Aronian, a draw against Ding Loren, beat Ding Loren, and drew Grishuk. You know, the star of this position for black is Magnus Carlsen, who's pretty good at chess. The main thing a6 does is it threatens dc4 and to hold the pawn with b5. Um, it's, it's a generally useful move to make, um, but the main point is we have this threat. Our idea is going to be when we can, we're going to grab on c4 and we're going to hold it with b5. And that's going to come with some risk. White can try to undermine with a4, and they also might have the opportunity to take over the center. And there are going to be some key themes and ideas we're going to have to know to be able to defend those positions adequately. But we're going to get unbalanced games. We're going to be up a pawn. We're going to have pretty active pieces. And usually white does not have compensation. The best lines for white do not involve letting us take the pawn. But we should know when we play a6, we're looking to take the pawn. I should say the main moves here are bishop e7, a very standard QGD, bishop b4, the Rogozin, uh, dc4, I believe is the Vienna variation, and there's also c6 transposing into a kind of semi-slav type structure. There are probably other moves that are legal here, but a6 is our move. Uh, white has a bunch of moves I want to cover. 
Um, if we look at the database, we can get a sense of what the most popular are. I think I'm going to look at the online database for this because it gives a better sense of what most players will actually face. So we see bishop g5 is very popular here. c takes d5. e3. Uh, bishop f4 I might not cover specifically. It's not a good move. You can see it scores actually okay here, but if we turn on the computer engine, black grabs and has a very nice position. Um, I may get to that specifically, but I don't think it's covered in my blog post. e3 defends c4. Uh, g3 tries to play this like a Catalan. Uh, that's not as common here, but still played. Um, a4 and c5 are not great moves. Um, I believe a4 actually black should play um, c5. Yeah, with a quick c5, black opens up the center now that white's made this kind of weakening move. The b4 square is very nice. Uh, you'll notice bishop b4 is also a good move, as is knight c6, again, noticing this weak square. Um, but black should immediately strike in the center, and white has kind of made a wasteful move. Black is well placed for the complications that ensue. c5 can be met by b6. Black just undermines the pawn, cb6, cb6, and you get a pretty normal position. Um, White's well, a little better, uh, and but black has kind of straightforward development. You might think the bishop on b7 is a little weak, but it's going to support knight e4. And in QGDs in general, if you ever play these, black is always looking for knight e4. It's just a, such a strong central square, and it forces white to have to work around this piece. If they take, then it becomes a strong central pawn, and the bishop is much more unleashed. If they don't take, the knight just does a lot there. Sometimes it can be supported with f5. I think this position is fairly comfortable for black to play, and you'll notice after b6, black scores a you know, very reasonable, slightly under 50% percentage. Now, so the more common moves are, we did a4, c5, are g3, e3, cd5, and bishop g5. Let's look at g3 first. So white looks to get the bishop on this diagonal, and if we take on c4 and play b5, it looks like they can potentially take advantage. But what's our plan? We're trying to take on c4. Does this prevent us from doing so? No, and we're going to see why. d takes c4, bishop g2, b5. Now this diagonal looks real scary, but we should know we actually have multiple good rejoinders to knight e5 ideas. There are two key ideas we need to remember against knight a5, two ways to play against it. One is, and this is our move here, is uh, it should be noted, if white doesn't try to open the diagonal, black will play bishop b7, and suddenly white doesn't have threats, black is up a pawn. So, knight e5. One is to just put the rook on a7. a6 gave us the square to put our rook on, it looks silly, but it's fine there. Now, it looks like white might crash through on c6, but bishop c6 is met by just bishop d7. If knight takes, we take back knight. We hit the bishop away, then we free ourselves with c5. Black's up a pawn. The rook can sometimes even shuttle over after the knight moves away. If bishop takes, knight takes not so good because of knight c6, so actually maybe queen a8. So maybe actually knight takes is fine. Is knight takes fine? I don't know. Knight b takes, I mean. Yeah, so knight b takes is fine, because knight c6 is a blunder due to queen a8. That's cute. So bishop d7 meets bishop c6, and if they try to come in the other way with knight c6, then almost exactly the same thing. We just block. Um, a more dangerous idea here is a4. And the point here is if they take and we take, they win our rook. So they have a real threat. But... The tempo actually works pretty well for us. We hit the knight away, and then we play bishop b7. They gotta trade the bishops, our rook's off the square. They cannot take on c4, because queen d5 forks the knight and the rook. I think I've won this game. Um, so black has some time to consolidate, or play a move like c5 undermining white center. Uh, black is a nice position. If we turn on the computer here, you know, you'll see black's better. Uh, the actual best move after um, b4, wait, yeah, 
Yeah, so one idea is this b4 followed by bishop b7, but black can also play bishop b7 immediately. And the point is if takes, rook takes, the rook has gotten off the square, white doesn't have to time, time to take because their bishops hit. This position, black's just held everything together. We haven't even had to advance b4. I think this immediate bishop b7 is even better than um, playing b4 first. Uh, white's best move is actually f3, and after c5, black is better. We take the opportunity to blast open the center. White's very awkward. Their pieces are all loose. A rook and a7 is actually pretty good. Um, so you can start to see how black will often take the pawn and make slightly weird-looking moves, but cannot be punished if black plays po properly. Uh, very double-edged. Like, we're playing, when we play this opening, we're not just playing to make a draw, you know, we're playing to create a win. I think another important point is black can often play c6. And this looks crazy. Uh, if bishop takes c6, then sure, knight takes c6, knight takes c6, queen moves, probably to b6. Knight e5, yeah, black looks nicely placed. Bishop b4, bishop d6, you know, black looks like they have a very nice position. But what about knight takes c6? If knight takes, bishop takes, will fork king and rook? This looks like just an abject disaster. Let's flip on the computer. It's not so bad, and it's because of this queen b6 idea. And this shows up a lot. One way to respond to knight e5 is rook a7 and bishop b7. But the other way is queen b6. And the point is, the only thing the knight can take is our knight, and then our rook gets off the long diagonal. If they don't do anything, well, we're threatening to take their knight, and if their knight retreats, we have time for bishop b7 countering the long diagonal. So I think against g3, there's two critical things to remember. We play b5, we take on c4, we play b5, I guess that's not the first thing, but that's kind of automatic in this opening. If they let us take c4, we take it, we play b5, and then if they try to punish us on the long diagonal, we have two main rejoinders, and depending on the position, white can have slightly different versions of this. You can choose between rook a7, with the idea of bishop b7, or c6, with the point that when they take, we can play queen b6, and they have no way to punish us on the diagonal, and we're just going to come with bishop b7. I think both moves are good, both ideas are worth knowing, and black is a good game. Next up, e3. Now, this one's actually, I think, really cool, because dc4 here does not look that good, right? Oftentimes in the QGD, black will delay dc4 until white has moved the bishop, and only then will they take on c4 so that white's bishop loses a turn. It turns out this is actually just a favorable queen's gambit accepted. Now, why is that? It looks like white has made all normal moves. Surely they should have a nice queen's gambit accepted. But let's look at a Queen's Gambit accepted move order. It's happening out there. I don't know. Uh, DC4, E3, Knight F6, Bishop C4. You can see this has been played a million times. E6, Knight F3, A6. And here, especially if we look at the Masters database, you'll note Castles is the main move. A4 is a move, preventing B5. Queen E2 is a move. Knight c3 is not a move masters play here. Now if we look at the Lee Chess database, you'll see Knight c3 is played quite a lot. It does not score well. What's the reason for that? Well, say castles, b5, just following out the line a little, bishop d3, say bishop b7, a4. Black's going to play b4. They can't let white take, and they don't want to take themselves, breaking up their pawns. They'll have two isolated pawns. Therefore, black plays b4. And what happens with this knight? It immediately hones in on the weak c4 square that black cannot now attack with a pawn because neither their b nor d pawns uh, can reach b5 or d5. Their d pawn's gone, their b pawn's too far advanced. The knight comes to c4. Now, if we look back at our position, white has already committed the knight to c3. We have the same line, except this knight's on c3. In the other line version, white had castles. Now, a4 is met by b4, and the knight doesn't have this immediate rerouting to c4. It would have to take a much longer path that just clearly lost two tempo, because it came to c3 and then came back to b1 instead of staying on b1 the whole time. The knight on c3 is actually misplaced in a QGA like this, and so black should take, play b5, 
and black will continue with bishop d7, knight d7, bishop e7, or d6, c5, castles. I think one nice thing to note is the queen can often come to b8, which gets it off the way, out of the way of where white's rooks tend to land, and also can support a bishop on d6. Let's go a little further in the line just to uh, see normal play. So bishop d3, bishop d7, castles, c5, black hits out immediately, though. They don't have to, they can wait a little. Uh, queen e2, knight bd7, rook d1, rook's on the same diagonal uh, file as the queen. Queen could come here, but it'll eventually get pestered. I like queen b8, and you'll see, wow, look at black's score in the database. This is master level games. Queen b8, and black just is scoring a tremendous percentage in the online database. You'll see black scoring pretty well here too, though apparently white happens to have done well with b3, but black is a good game. If we flip on the computer, uh, it gives a tiny advantage to white, though I suspect it will lower the longer we leave it, and so it is doing. Um, black's equal. The knight on c3 is actually misplaced, because white's key break against black's pawns is a4, and the knight on c3, despite adding pressure to b5, because of b4, will not have a home, and white doesn't have their standard break and black is this really easy, comfortable development. So against e3, I think black's already equal. You'll see it was giving zero. This dc4 idea just gives immediate equality with our standard b5 after, and we're good. And I think it's cool when white can make all normal moves, knight c3, knight f3, the natural e3, and get nothing. Uh, so I guess I should go a little further after dc4, white can play a4, but here too, knight c3 is not actually where the knights wanted, and a4 leaves the b4 square a little weak. So this is another transposition to the queen's gambit accepted. We play c5, and again, the knight's not right on c3. Takes knight c6, just developing our pieces, pieces castles, bishop b7, queen e2, this is just the main line. The actual moves don't matter a ton. cd4, uh, white will be left with an isolated pawn, or lose a pawn, unless they find rook d1. I like e5 here, forcing the exchange of more pieces. And white has this cool shot here, queen e5, because the rook's defended, but black can just play queen d6. This is equal. I don't think the line's super important to know, but I think after a4, knowing play c5, and then develop your pieces and pressure their d4 pawn, is a um, pretty good antidote. e3 allows black equality. And it's just so interesting to me that this early knight c3 gives white so much weaker of a version than a normal uh, QGA for white. So, okay, we're down to two moves left. Bishop g5 and cd5. These are the critical moves. These are the moves you will see most. At the master level, cd5, by far the most popular move. But at the club level, bishop g5 is by far the most popular move. And let me tell you something. It's not scary. Black's better. And how is black better? Okay, black might not be better, but it's about equal. Black has our standard thing. We're going to play dc4. We're going to play b5. We're just going to take the pawn. Now, I don't know how many viewers, we'll come back to this line, have ever looked at the Botvinnik semislav. But if you haven't, it's just about the most complicated line in all of chess. It is truly absurd. Black takes a pawn and holds it. White attacks in the center. They attack the pinned piece. The only thing black can do is h6. And then they must break the pin. And white can now sack the knight to keep the pin because they will get this knight back. There's also a move here, knight d5. And this line gets really complicated too. I'm moving through the moves quickly because we don't actually have to know anything about this opening. The point is just to show how absurd it is. After knight g5, h g5, bishop g5, black plays knight d7. White has this pin, they don't need to do anything immediately, so they usually play g3 to get activity here. Black can play rook g8, I believe the main move is um, queen b6, breaking the pin, ef6, bishop b7, bishop g2, castles queen side, castles king side, b4, and white used to play knight a4, more recently they've played the crazy rook b1, just trying to sacrifice the knight to open the b-file, Somehow, this position is, like, just the start. Um, oh, white probably has included d5. I think I'm screwing up the moves. I haven't looked at this in a while. But the point is, this is one of the most insane lines in chess. 
we are going to be getting something similar. We will take on c4, we will play b5, they have bishop g5, they have e5, but actually it's a better version and we're totally fine. Let's return to our line. dc4. So white's critical try is, of course, e4. If they're, uh, you know, trying to play a4, we'll hit out with c5, and, you know, they're going to get this kind of crappy qga because the knight's on the wrong square. If they play something like e3, we play b5. The pressuring move is e4, threatening e5. And we are going to hold the pawn. That's what we do. We take on c4, and then we hold it, and we say, we're up a pawn. They hit our knight. We have to play h6 because the knight is pinned, and otherwise we're just losing a piece. Bishop h4. If they take, we take, they take, we take, and we're just up. We just have the two bishops. We have this extra pawn even after they regain. I guess after they regain this, we don't have an extra pawn. We got these two fantastic bishops, and if they do take, they can't take their queens there. What am I talking about? We're up a pawn. We might threaten g4 and pressure here. We have these two wonderful bishops. Uh, I don't know what that arrow was. You know, black's better. If we flip on the computer, black's a lot better. Uh, so white must play bishop h4. Now we must break the pin, g5. If white doesn't sack the piece, then black just comes to d5. We're up a pawn. We're up a pawn. We're happy. Again, let's give the computer a quick look. The computer says, we're up a pawn. We're happy. So white must sack the knight in the same way as the botvinnik to keep the pin. And much like the botvinnik, we want to defend our knight. And a nice way to do so is knight d7. We don't actually know where the bishop belongs. The bishop could go to e7 to break the pin, but sometimes the bishop's good on b4. Sometimes it can question the bishop from h6. This bishop has a lot of squares that it might go to. The knight could go to c6 and hit d4, but knight d7 gives our bishop a lot more possibility, while our knight is probably going to go to d7 anyway. It's not in the way of the bishop, it'll come out the other way. So knight d7 is the more useful move to make. e takes f6, bishop b7. Uh, if I flip on the computer, it will give black an advantage here. It may take a little to think about it, but it's going to, this advantage is going to keep increasing. Yep, we're already up to minus 0 0.5. Now back to minus 0 0.3, but I think if you give it more time, black's advantage will get larger here. Yep. Um, so there's a few things white can try. D5. This is scary. If we take, we need to check, and we're going to lose a piece. Can't do that. If we take bishop, knight d5, then queen e2 check. Can't do that. So we can't take this, and they threaten to take on e6, and then play f7 check and win our queen. So we have to defend e6. We don't have many ways to do it, but knight c5. We're good. Happily, we'll take back knight and trade queens if they try to take. Uh, bishop e2, I think, has been tried here. And... Oh, no, actually, knight c5 is just fine for black. Like, we don't have to know any more than knight c5. Um, another move that's been tried is bishop e2 with the idea of bishop f3 trading off our bishop. Um, the computer here is torn between taking on g2 and playing something like b4. But I also thought um, bishop h6 was really interesting, just trading off the, uh, the defender of this pawn and we'll trade our bishops, and then we'll recapture the pawn one way or the other. We're still on g2. Uh, black is doing phenomenally well here, per usual. Uh, another line is, if we go back, so I think black's just fine here. We do need to know d5 is met by knight c5, um, and a nice idea is to trade off their good bishop, and then f6 will be undefended. If we go back a turn, they do not have to take on f6 immediately. Bishop b2 is an interesting move. The point is, Bishop b7 can be met by bishop f3, and here we get some fireworks. This is a line given by Tony Rotella. Uh, kudos to him, because great line. Knight takes e5, removing the attacker on our knight, attacking their bishop, leaving our bishop undefended. Bishop takes b7, knight d3 check. We get our knight out of dodge, and after king e1, Tony Rotella gives bishop e7, the bishop h6, and rook b8 are fine. But I like this, bishop e7, bishop takes, queen takes. We're down in exchange, but we've got this potential g-file pressure. Our c4 pawn, 
You know, we take this pawn and we think, ah, they've gambited a pawn, right? They get the center, and this pawn's a weakness. But this pawn's actually really strong if we can hold on to it. You know, in a lot of Queen's Gambit-like lines, black takes c4 and white regains it, and it doesn't feel like a ton happened. The white had to spend a little time regaining it. But if we can keep it, this pawn's awesome. This pawn's not a weakness at all. So I like this line, but if you don't want to sacrifice an exchange, rook v8 is also fine. And also, bishop h6 instead of b7 is fine. If we flip on the computer after this exchange sacrifice, you can see it likes black. And one really useful thing to do when looking at an opening, when you're like, okay, I like my position, but I don't get what I do. Just hit the X button when you're on Lee Chess, and it'll show you your threat. So one thing is, we are threatening b2. We are threatening rook g8, which will skewer the bishop to g2, which our queen is on. Uh, b4, and where does the knight go? The knight doesn't really have a square. Can't come to e4 or d5. Um, it also gives king d7, which is kind of surprising. Don't really know what's going on there. But you can see, by clicking the X button, we see some of the key ideas in this position. We threaten b2, we threaten b4, we think about rook g8. So, if we pass the turn to white and say, okay, what if they defend the most obvious threat? Now we can think, okay, so knight b2 is not a threat. Now maybe we switch over to b4. Where's the knight going? Knight e2. Knight g4. Ah, so we've learned another thing. We were also, if the knight stops defending, stops the queen from defending g4, or stops defending e4, maybe black can come in with the knight and hit f2. That's another idea in the position. So we can do some exploration, find some ideas, learn a bit about it. If you get this kind of position and don't know what to do, pressing the X button can really give you a sense of what you want. It's okay. I, I love these lines. When I was first playing this, I just kept getting people playing bishop g5. I'd rip the pawn, I'd play b5, I'd play h6 and g5. Uh, they'd, of course, sack the knight. I never face bishop g3. It is a poor move. Um, and I'd just get these positions. And I don't think I ever actually face d5, the, the best move, the one where I actually have to know something. And I would just be very happy. At some point, I'm going to regain on f6. Just had a lot of fun here. Won a bunch of games. It's a good opening. So, a6, I think bishop g5 is already not so good. I think we equalize immediately against e3. I think c5 and a4 are not serious threats. g3, we take on c4, we play b5, and they try to open on the long diagonal, and we either give the pawn back with c6 and this weird queen b6 idea, or we just play rook a7. Why don't people play this opening? Well, if we bring up that database again with Magnus Carlsen, I bet if we looked at the four games against Magnus Carlsen, they'd all see C takes D5. If I click C takes D5, we have the same four games listed. Because at the top level, everyone's playing C takes D5. Why is this annoying? Well, white switches to an exchange variation. Now, the exchange variation with knight F3 is not supposed to be so good, but in the exchange, black never plays A6. It's not a terrible move, but it's not a move black would choose, and so white switches to this kind of exchange variation idea. Exd5, bishop g5. If our pawn was on c6 instead of a6, we'd play bishop e7, and then we'd play bishop f5, and white would be, with their slow knight f3, would not have time to play e3 and bishop d3 first. c6 is a more useful move than a6. They both control b5, but c6 reinforces our d5 pawn, and makes it easier for us to defend b7 if the bishop comes out, such that queen b, such that if we bring the bishop out, now here white might have takes and pressure on d5, but also queen b3 hits d5 and b7. Now if we had c6 in instead, and somehow got the bishop out, then queen b3, d5's already well defended, and it's easier for us to defend b7. So switching to this makes a lot of sense for white. If we tried to continue the same way, bishop e7, e3, bishop f5. Uh, bishop f5 is an important idea because white's bishop on d3 is their best piece, and bishop f5 fights that. Normally, if black gets this in QGD variations, black is equalized. But here, queen b3, and these pawns are too weak. So a6 instead of c6 means we can't do things we'd normally like to do. Uh, normally, the downside of knight f3 is that we get to get in bishop f5. We don't here so we can't take advantage. Now, 
There are other downsides, however, to knight f3, and we're going to try to take advantage of those. And one is, normally white delays development and has the option to go to e2, which gives them the option of f4, which means if we play out a bishop early to e6, they will be able to chase it and annoy it. Here, they can't. So we're going to play bishop e6. We're trying to take advantage of the fact that white doesn't actually want to quick knight f3. Again, it's very subtle. It's like in the lines with a quick e3, how white didn't want to have played knight c3. Here, knight f3 is just a little different than what white wants, so we can try to develop against it. And we get, this is our normal development, here's our normal position. This is the main tabia of the opening. Um, here's black's normal position. If you look at this and think, ugh, then you shouldn't play this opening. If you look at this and then think, Black looks totally equal, like, you know, I've developed all my pieces, white has no particular threats, white's not really ever going to play the e4 break, because d4 is weak, you know, they don't have this standard minority attack, because my pawn's not on c6, this looks great. Well, then, this opening's probably for you. There are a few different ways black can play it. One is they can say, I've not spent a turn on c6, so I'm going to play a quick c5. Another idea is to kind of play this normal for knight e4 idea. Uh... You can play c6, rook e8, and look for an eventual knight e4 at a moment when the uh, the pin is broken. Um, Carlson does play a lot of rook e8s here. And then there is a game Tony Rowe gives here, where black plays h6 and g5. So I'm going to, I think, quickly show, just skim through, not looking at every move, but just looking for the core ideas, a few different Carlson games. So I guess we'll start with this one. Did the screen switch? It did. Hallelujah. Where Carlson first drove the bishop away, then attacked the knight on f3. That's a bit awkward because the queen's not defending it. But then I think the core idea here is he went for this quick c5. The pawn never lost a tempo. And black develops actively. I don't immediately know why queen b6 was played. He comes to this critical e4 square, always be looking for knight e4s. Uh, I assume the other knight will come to e4 soon. Yep. And here, Carlsen ground down the end game, but clearly black is better, they have the active rook. Uh, here was the probably losing blunder, because it allowed the rook to get behind the other pawns. Okay, so a nice win by Carlsen against Ryazantsev. Uh, let's bring up another. Here is a Carlson win against Grishuk. Or a Carlson game. Maybe they drew. Um, we have our normal opening. They play the exchange in bishop g5, but we now have this e6 square for a bishop. Develops normally. Questions with h6, then play c6. Just making the center solid, saying, okay, I don't need c5 here. Rook e8 is always going to support knight e4 ideas. Now the queen's going to move out of the way, and now knight e4 can be played. And the point is, if white takes twice, black will have discoveries with the bishop, because the rook supports e4. With knight e4 played, black now can start this kingside expansion, and starts it with f5. Never really gets it super going, as I recall, in this game. And Grishuk does, I believe, hold the draw. Uh, no, this is starting to look pretty good for Carlson. Yeah, Carlson will end up winning this, okay. Though he does blow the lead a few times, but he has the pass pawns. But the end game's not super important for our purposes. I think the point here is Carlson plays c6 to solidify the center, throws an h6, sees where the bishop's going to go, then plays rook e8, gets the queen out of the way, and plays this quick knight e4, and has a nice position. So that's um, Carlson against Grishuk. Uh, and another idea. We're just looking for ideas for our toolbox. Now we're switching over to a game Carlson played against Ding Loren. Gonna see the opening again. Came to it from a different move order. Plays this quick a6. Same stuff we've seen. Defends the bishop. Plays this early rook e8. Now he does some queenside stuff, but again, going for this quick knight e4. And just quickly scanning through these high-level games can give you a sense of, okay, that's an idea I can play in the opening. Just possible lines. Here's one more. 
This is from a game Tony Rowe gave. Same stuff. And this early h6, g5, knight h5 stop white from having the two bishops. Knight g7 is an odd move, but at some point black will take on e5. Black takes on e5 as soon as white gives their bishop a retreat in this game, and black has the two bishops. Also potentially has some kingside expansion, sides to go queenside so that things can be moved on the kingside more freely, and you get a complicated game. But this is another idea, is that this quick h6, g5, knight h5 can be played if black wants to grab the two bishops. So there's a few ideas for you in the exchange. Um, I think the exchange is white's most testing option, but if you look at this position, it's not so bad for black. Um, the computer is giving a bigger advantage than I'd expect. Uh, human play here says after castles, black is scoring above 50%, so can't complain there. I think this is just about the worst position you're going to get out of this opening. If you like the lines where you can grab on c4 and play b5, then you're going to love this opening, because you're going to get those a lot. So a quick summary of some things. Uh, if we go back, our point of a6 is we're simply threatening to grab on c4 and play b5. If we, they play e3, we can move into a favorable queen's gambit accepted. They actually, they don't lose a tempo taken back, but their knight's misplaced on c3. If they play bishop g5 or g3, we need to know something. Both get complicated, but black is already, I think, at least equal. The only real pressuring move is cd5, and then we're going to try to take advantage by putting our bishop on e6, playing knight d7, bishop d6, castles. Uh, rook e8 will be a useful move there. We can play c6, or we can play c5. We do have this h6 and g5 option, though h6 is pretty useful to include regardless. Now, I do want to talk about one more thing, which is 3a6. Now, we have the same idea. We're just threatening to take on c4, and we're doing it a move earlier. We are avoiding cd5, ed5, bishop g5 for obvious reasons unlike the knight f6 move order when white can play that version of the exchange. However, white has not committed to knight f3 here, so it's going to work a little differently. Now, c5 is now going to be met differently. We had b6 last time. Here, we could actually play e5, undermine the pawn more at the chain to try to leave this pawn weak. E5 would not be possible if they had played knight f3. We can already start to see some of the differences here. Um, against knight f3, take on c4, super excited to do so, and I've gotten a bunch of games that have transposed two lines we've already seen with the early bishop g5, oops, bishop g5, and I think black is a nice game here. Um, the lines, again, they work a little differently, but black wants this quick b5. Um, if something like g3 now, then we probably have a little more, we have a little more trouble taking immediately, right? But maybe we can play c6 and b5. So lines are going to work a little differently. I think another thing about a6 is a lot of players will kind of, more players will look to play the exchange here. Um, at the master level, we know cd5 is the main move, but at lower levels, cd5 is pretty popular too, and we're going to get into similar exchange stuff to before. So, I don't, I thought the 3a6 move order probably was a little more practical, because you avoid the, having to know stuff in the exchange QGD, but I did have better results with knight f6 first when playing this. Uh, so this is the Janowski QGD, and our points, we're just going to take, we're going to play b5, we're going to say this pawn on c4, not a weakness, but a strength, and we're going to prove it. And that is the Janowski QGD. Hope you enjoyed this.